Hello, dear all. This is the Lama Life live stream event of Lama Sultrim Aliyane. I'm Dreame, and it's always a pleasure to be here with you and for you. Today's event highlights the meeting of two incredible women. Lama Sultrim Aliyane has invited an end of life coach and home funeral guide, Rhonda Lopresti to discuss conscious preparation for the time of dying. Rhonda is passionate in holding and creating sacred space, personal ritual, spiritual practice, and creative choices through dying and death care. She believes we can learn to die, and in learning to die, we actually awaken to life itself. She's consciously serving and raising awareness about the home funeral option where we can apply our spiritual practices and create auspicious conditions at the time of death. Rhonda is a student of Tibetan Buddhism and has studied under Chokhi Nyingma Rinpoche for 35 years and serves as a board and volunteer member for Rangju Yeshe Gonde, California. She regularly retreats for teachings on POA and how to navigate the bardos. Rhonda is based in San Diego, California. Before I turn it over to Lama Sultrim and our wonderful guest today, some additional details, details from me. Uh, as we connect here uh, each week from um, different places around the world, please uh, offer us a, a hello in the chat as we really want you to um, be aware that having you here is absolutely important to us and we always want to hear from you. Your comments and questions are carefully addressed and the fact that uh, you make an effort to watch every event in this series, even if it's impossible to do so live, and that you, you watch it several times just shows us how precious and timely our meetings are. You are part of it. I also remind you that uh, you will have an opportunity to offer Dana uh, to Lama Sultrim and Rhonda Lopresti. I will talk more about it towards the end of the event. Now, uh, I want to briefly touch on two very interesting programs that you can join this summer. Uh, but there is so much more that Tara Mandala is offering, so please join our mailing list to stay informed. Exactly a month from now, so on July 12th, uh, Tara Mandala opens a truly unique nine-week online course called Writing Your Spiritual Care Directive, a Buddhist plan for the time of death with our guest, Rhonda Lopresti. She presents this course not as a teacher of the Dharma, but as a gatherer of Dharma friends to hold safe space, to share, inspire, and develop community on the topic of dying. And one of the programs uh, you can attend in person on the land in Colorado is this super interesting Tibetan sacred art restoration training with Lama Gurma Rabke. It will take place between August 16th and August 20th. This program will provide an introductory training on Tibetan sacred art painting using the beautiful Trikaya Temple as the focus. If you are interested, a detailed description is on our website. With sincere excitement for our time together and the special conversation that awaits us today, I'm welcoming our dear teacher. Lama Sultrim Alyone. Hello, hello. 
<laughs> Hello. Um, to me, <laughs> just sending Bodhi a message. Um, good morning, everyone out there in the ethers. Great to be with you. Feel your presence. Let's take an and do that with each other, connect with each other, <sighs> feeling each other's presence around the world. and feeling ourselves as a community. There's such strength in community when people practice and pray together. And in that context, let's raise bodhicitta, the intention to be together for the benefit of all beings. Thank you. And let's take a moment to let people check in from wherever they are in the world. Um, and just say your first name and where you're, where you're tuning in from. That gives us an idea of who's here. Thank you, everyone. And I'd like to read the prayer requests. We don't have a lot today. So just begin with that. The prayer requests are people who write in and they either themselves or they know someone who really needs some collective energy. And so during the prayer requests, we send that out to those people. And so my request of you today is to, as I say these names, to say, send that this person your positive, loving, healing energy, and imagine that they are healed. So the first person is Andrea Sepulveda, in Madrid, Spain. Sonia, Marga, Martin, Hella Krauter, and Johnny Rad Radulsko, Heidenheim, Ad Brenz, Germany. Rita, Andrea, Schwermont, Krefeld, Germany. A mother of a beloved friend who passed away due to an accident. So that's the person writing in her friend's mother. Sounds like a tragic situation. Thank you. So I see people from Poland, Oregon, Prince Edward Island, New Orleans, Durango, Germany, Canada, lots of different places. Isn't it amazing? I mean, I think we've really taken for granted now that we can do things like this to the point where we're actually zoomed out <laughs> from so many meetings and working online and so on. But it still really is amazing that connect like this, very precious. It's one of the upsides of technological development. So, oh, sorry, that's my dog. She's working. 
Um, so, yeah, let's do a little meditation this morning. Bring ourselves closer together. Um, and I'd like to do a meditation on death today, since that's what we will be doing. So I'd like to invite you to bring yourself to your own death. Imagine that you are on your deathbed. Imagine where you are. You feel that you're going to make this transition. And so who do you have around you at that time? Who's with you? And as you're laying there on your deathbed, do you have any regrets? If you do have something to say to someone or a message, maybe you give that to who's ever present with you, or if it's a regret connected to one of those people, you take a moment and apologize or express that regret. And then take a moment to feel the release of all those regrets and the freedom that comes from that. And then take a moment to review all the positive things that you've done in your life, all the people that you've impacted in a positive way, all the things that you've done, spoken or thought. Really let yourself feel all those positive feelings, connections. And then feel the spiritual energies that are also present around you and allow yourself to tap into those energies and welcome them, connect with them. Perhaps this is a teacher, perhaps it's a deity like Tara or the lion-headed Dakini Simuka or Chenrezig, another deity, Amitabha, 
and let your consciousness link with those beings. Feel their presence. And then focus on one of those, one of them. One that you feel most close to. Have most connection with. And then imagine that your own mind, your consciousness, travels up through the central channel from the heart center where it dwells during your lifetime. It's the seat of your consciousness. Travels up through the central channel in your body from the heart to the top of your head. And then that consciousness exits through the top of your head and goes into the heart of one of these beings that you've chosen and is present with them, enfolded and protected by their energy. and opening into a whole new dimension of their dimension. What is it like to be there? What's around you? And feel the freedom from your body. You can shed, shed your body and go into a place like this with this energy field. And release any attachment to those you've left behind. Also send reassurance to them that you're fine. And let your mind open into its true nature, which is vast, beginningless, endless, beyond time. And all pervading. all pervading, awake, luminous awareness. And rest there. Just rest.
from this space you can choose where you will direct this mind stream, this mind body. another body or into a pure land. Very free, limitless. And then for now we will bring that awareness back into this body Feel it coming back in through the top of your head, through the center of your body, reestablishing itself in the heart center. Feeling grateful to those who gathered around you. And then opening your eyes, and coming back together here, now. So wonderful. And from that, I would like to bring us now into the presence of Rhonda, who actually lives quite close to where I am now. Welcome, Rhonda. Thank you, Lama. You're welcome. Um, So, take a minute to come back to my body. So Rhonda, thank you for coming. And it's great you're going to do this course with Tara Mandala. I know a lot of people are excited about it and feel it's, you know, we talk a lot about death and so on and Buddhism and permanence, but do we actually face our own death and prepare for it in a way that's helpful? Uh, When we spoke um, about this, we spoke about how what you're doing is really a gift to the people that you leave behind and not preparing is not a gift. And I know that because my sister died and she didn't leave a will. She had a will that was like 20 years old and nobody really knew where it was and there was no directive, etc. And so it's been very difficult for her children to, to know what to do. So really grateful to you. And I think the first thing I'd like to ask you about is how did you personally come to this work? Yeah, thank you. Well, first, I just want to thank you for that meditation, Lama. Um, that is so needed. So yeah. needed. And um, I know that there's people listening today that are in end of life that are caring for someone at end of life and to receive that meditation right now was just precious. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Yeah, I had the very good fortune to meet my teacher when I was 20 years old, Chokini Marimpache. And it's been, his teachings have been my primary guidance in this lifetime. Um, I, his very first gift to me Uh, back in 1987 was a book called The Mirror of Mindfulness, a book on the Bardos. And I took that as an omen that I would um, study end of life and conscious dying uh, for the rest of my life. And so, yeah, I've, I've served as a hospice volunteer. I've studied as an end of life coach. Um, I've developed as a um, home funeral guide and um and i help people get their affairs in order generally for end of life but my passion project has always been the spiritual care directive um 
years ago, I attended a very beautiful Tibetan Buddhist um, end of life workshop by a Dharma sister, Paloma, Laund Paloma Laundry, and she guided us in doing our end of life affairs as practitioners. And I felt that that was just an amazing experience. And so I've evolved this end of life planning as it pertains for the practitioner and our spiritual wishes in what's called the spiritual care directive. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, just like a medical care directive that we hear very commonly where we make our medical choices and choose our medical advocates, I noticed we weren't, there wasn't an opportunity to make all of those choices spiritually. And so, um, yeah, it's been a really beautiful experience. And just listening to your meditation today is such a reminder of, um, are we prepared? Do we, um, do we, do we know what kind of auspicious environment that we want to create around dying? Do we, do we know what our regrets are? Do we know what our aspirations are? Um, so just hearing your meditation was such a reminder of um, how working on a spiritual care directive well in advance of our dying moments is so powerful. Yeah, really, really powerful. What was the name of the book that you mentioned? That was the first book that you... Yeah, The Mirror of Mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, there's the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying that's been really helpful to people as well. Right. Yeah. yeah. So many. Um, Anyan Rinpoche's book, Dying with Confidence. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew Holacek's book, um, Preparing to Die. So, mm -hmm. so good. Um, so many good resources. So in your course, will you um, cover some of those things? So yeah, in the course, it's such a beautiful opportunity. We move through 10 parts. And so we'll start with our vision, which is what you invited us to do just now. You know, create a vision for yourself. Begin to see what you would aspire to have happen, which is such a beautiful practice, really, because as we aspire to um, imagine what kind of environment we would like at the time of dying and where we would like to be um, in our meditation practice and surrounded by, by Dharma friends, by knowing what we want at the end of our life, we can begin establishing that now, right? So we don't want to find ourselves trying to pull all that together at the end of life when we are distracted by illness, when we're distracted by pain, mm -hmm. when, we're, um, when time is running out. And so by doing this long in advance, we can um, be really open and, and access all of our resources and ideas and, and our creativity in establishing a vision that can kind of be our guiding principle. And then we move through our aspirations. What are our aspirations? What aspirations have touched us? Whether they're traditional, whether they're personal, sometimes people self-author aspirations. I mean, I can share personally, my, my personal mantra is I always want to be open and curious. And so that's kind of my pithy or my personal aspiration, be open and curious. And so I've written that in my spiritual care directive. And when my loved ones can see that that's something that's really meaningful, now they're empowered to share that. Maybe if I'm unconscious or in a coma or I'm drifting into the transitional state, to have them whisper my aspiration prayers or my personally authored ones would be so powerful for me. So uh, then we move into choosing our Dharma friends. Who do we know that are local, even across the nation or even the world that might support us at our time of dying? And what are our requests? Um, people can help us remotely. I mean, you, you mentioned as we went in today, our prayer lists. People can put each other on their prayer list. They can sponsor prayers. We can love each other from afar. So we, you know, it's really beautiful to think about what kind of friends and Dharma support do we want at the moment of dying in our environment? And how can we access all of the support we have around the world? Um, we, I, then the, the, the next um, place we go into is um, building a Dharma box. 
what kind of ritual items will support you? Do you have liberation pills or talk drolls or mantra blankets? Or do you, sometimes people like to print mantras on little pieces of paper that can be used for children to place them on your in your casket when you're dying. And so can we start to build some of these beautiful um, ways that people can be engaged with death and dying and have it in one place? Because we know that when we die, especially if it's suddenly, it can be really hard to find our things at three in the morning or at the last minute. So having a Dharma box that has all of our items in it that would be really supportive. Uh, then we move into approaching dying. That would be the fifth um, module and talking about um, what do you see in your, um, what are your preferences? What are your wishes as you approach death? How do you feel about medication? How do you feel about sedation? What kind of environment do you want to create? Um, all the things about approaching dying, we get to really take a deep look at that and what would be supportive. Um, then we talk about the moment of death. What are our, what are the last thoughts that we want to have? What, um, what's going to be really helpful? You know, I love this quote. I found a quote by the Dalai Lama that said, when we're dying, there will be two things that will really support us through our dying. What we remember and what our friends urge us to do, which is so beautiful because we can really be thinking about that in advance. We can be thinking about what do we really want to remember personally? What have we learned from our teachings? And what can we invite our friends to urge us to do, which is such an act of kindness to be able to invite our friends in. And, you know, people end up feeling very helpless, very powerless, very confused. And so having a spiritual care directive can be really helpful. And then again, I'm moving through our three days following death, where we'll talk about the home funeral and how that's really applicable for the Tibetan Buddhist. Yeah. Can I interrupt you for a minute? Sure. It's really hard to see you. Uh, you're backlit. Is it possible to to turn your your computer so that you're at, uh, like you don't have the windows behind you? Or, I you should I close the blinds? Maybe. Let's see. That'll help. That'll yeah, help. that helps quite a bit. Thank you. Uh, maybe sure. if you close it all the way, um, uh, yeah. it would be better. And uh, you know, make it as closed as possible. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you so much. It's no problem. Yeah, yeah, we just, you know, it's frustrating not to be able to see you. Um, sure. Yeah, so I want to ask you a question before you go into the next thing um, that bubbled up for me. The Dharma box, um, and you said a mantra blanket. Was that the idea that there would be mantras that people could put on you in the casket? Or yeah, that yeah, that's actually a reference to um, a Darini blanket that has been made and created by Pakchok Rinpoche. He has it in his Akara collection. So it's a blanket that might have a mantra, um, a you know, a prayer printed on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so number number one was starting with our vision. Vision number two. Our aspirations then um, really um, establishing our Dharma friends Dharma friends supporters building our Dharma box the fourth and yes, um, approaching death uh-huh preparations yes okay. and then the moment of death right what would be painful for us uh-huh yeah. uh, the three days following death creating uh -huh. a or family directed home funeral uh -huh. then choosing our disposition of body meaning our cremation or burial and all that's involved around that uh, uh -huh. then finish with our 49 days 
and sponsoring prayers and all the activity of the 49 days and our Dharma will. What do we want to do with all of our sacred items, our tankas, our statues, or our private, um, even secret um, collections? Uh huh. Yeah. Wow. That's that's really so thorough. Mm -hmm. And so there'll be uh, different sessions when each one of these is yes, considered? Yes, each night will be dedicated because it's, it, it's a nine week program. And so each night we'll focus on each one of those sessions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, excellent. Yeah. 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 So, so tell me some stories about uh, how this has worked for people. Have you had people do this and then have gone through death? Yes, yes. I mean, I learned so much. You know, we I gather people together to work on your spiritual care directive. And it's amazing, you know, because again, as practitioners, we want to be um, we want to be prepared. We want to um, we want to be able to apply our practice. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, to really refine what's been meaningful to us is so powerful. You know, it ends up being such an experience of we get to share our spiritual care directive. So it invites really deep conversations with our family and friends. It ends up being a healing experience because by looking at all of this in advance, we can process our resistances, our regrets, like you mm -hmm. mentioned meditation like isn't that amazing that we could work with all of that now yeah. so that it's not showing up for the first time when we're in the vulnerabilities of dying yeah so um as a personal experience i had my spiritual care directive out one day and a girlfriend read it and she started crying and i said what's happening for you as you read this and she said you know if I were at your bedside and you were in a coma and or you were facing end of life, she said, I would be so heartbroken and sad and lost. But she said, as I read your spiritual care directive and I hear your aspirations and your wishes and your um, how your practice has influenced your life, she says, this gives me so much peace. Uh -huh. Peace. Yeah. And it's just a beautiful demonstration of what's possible. Have you had anyone who, who's actually done these 10 steps and then died? Um, I, you know, gratefully, anyone who's come to my gathering um, has not. Um, but I've witnessed the possibility of these steps being fulfilled. Mm -hmm. We had a beautiful Tibetan Buddhist here in San Diego who died uh, this last fall, winter. And I got to watch the the steps unfold which uh -huh. was really beautiful yes so did did he or she know that she was dying or he that know that he was dying um for a while yes um well, you know he he suffered from cancer so there was um a, it was a gradual dying and they brought me in because another aspect of building a spiritual care directive is you begin to see what an educational process it is. I mean, we mm. just know what our options are and what our rights mm. are when it comes to end of life. And so yeah. I was able to um, serve, it was a Tibetan community and I was able to serve them in letting them know that they could have a home funeral, mm. that they could compassionately transport this Tibetan Buddhist from the home to the crematory that they could establish their rituals at the crematory. Um, things that people just didn't understand were available to them. So mm -hmm. not only are we putting our practices and our teachings into like a real death plan, we're also learning about all the resources in our community. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's, a, yeah, that, yeah, it's amazing. And another beautiful thing that happens in group is when we come together and have, let's say we have 40 people that want to, that um, have gathered to talk about death and dying. Now we have, we've expanded our awareness by 40 because everybody mm -hmm. brings something to the conversation. Mm -hmm. Everybody brings an idea, a resource, a perspective, a teaching. Mm -hmm. And so we just expand 
mm-hmm. what's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's amazing and helpful. Yeah. You told me there were some secrets uh, connected yeah. to this. Maybe you can, I guess you can share the secrets. <laughs> no, well, I say there's like hidden secrets. We've talked about a couple of them. One is the healing. People don't recognize that by doing a spiritual care directive that they're going to heal what's what's what their resistances, their negative biases about death and dying long in advance. And so that can be an mm-hmm. unexpected result that people don't mm-hmm. expect. The education, we talked a bit about that. We don't recognize what, an, what access we have to support. Like just sharing with your community here that you're available, you have a prayer list, that you, that, we can sponsor prayers for your loved ones. People sometimes don't even recognize that they have that support. So it's such an education. Um, mm-hmm. I say that, so that's two. So a third one is it's inspirational. When you start really building your spiritual care directive and really looking into what's important to you, if you're going to want to be able to access that at the time of dying, mm-hmm. it's important to begin building those habits and perspectives now well in advance so it ends up inspiring your daily practice mm-hmm. at least that's what happened for me the more i studied death and dying the more i realized how precious today was and how awake i would want to be and how precious my teachings were and that i would really need to behold them and and really know them and memorize them I mean, not memorizing, like memorizing a whole maybe aspiration prayer, but but knowing what I want to remember at the mm-hmm. moment. It's so inspiring. Um, I think another thing people don't recognize is it's um, it's a contemplative experience. Like it really invites you to think about what's important to you. What have you personally um, gotten confidence in? So that you can really clarify that and use that as a support through your dying. And then maybe lastly, I'll just say, we end up building community. We end mm-hmm. up bridging um, people that come to groups, find out that they've got Dharma sisters and brothers in their area, or they mm-hmm. begin to um, reach across the country and know that they'll be there for each other. And so those are some of the secrets that we just don't expect to have happen. Mm-hmm. You know, I think one of the resistances is the thought that if you start really sort of formulating your death, you're going to make it come faster or, you know, kind of encourage it. My mother lived to be 99. And whenever I would bring up death with her, she would always say, oh, darling, that's not a very cheerful subject. (laughs) And um so how do you how do you work with that also within yourself like oh if i actually start focusing on this maybe i'm gonna make it happen sooner yeah i think i rely on a few things um i think there was a a comment made that if you think about getting pregnant you're not necessarily going to cause pregnancy right so (laughs) um and um it's it i feel like sometimes i say it's a bit of a superstition i'm actually very uh very um sensitive to people that say when they invoke thought you know you can create your reality and so i appreciate and understand that it's just my own experience has been that we're already dying every moment like we're already facing transitions Mm -hmm. every day um, how do we, how are we managing those transitions? How are we getting from, where are we seeking refuge? What is giving us confidence and helping us feel connected to our teaching every moment of the day? So again, I think for me, it's been more of an inspirational experience of becoming more awake and alive today. And um, I also heard once that in the Tibetan tradition, we can't really, um, our our death day is our death day, and we can't really call it forward, and we can't really push it out, and I mean, we do take long life pills, and we can have many blessings, but that our, our, maybe the end of our life is kind of set in some way, Mm -hmm. so um, 
But yeah, I think I would say mostly I've seen that this experience is more of an inspiration to living. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In the teachings, we say you don't know when you're going to die, where you're going to die, or how you're going to die. It's probably one of the most unpredictable things that we experience in life. But for me, for example, I have a heart condition and the heart is pretty essential. <laughs> it's not like, you know, I have a toe condition. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, sometimes my heart's kind of going crazy in one way or another. And then I'm like, wow, maybe, maybe this is it. So I understand that idea of could happen at any time. The Tibetans also have something which is an, it's part of the Tibetan culture of believing that each person has a lifespan that's pre-assigned to them. And one of the things in Tibet that people do is to ask lamas, how long am I going to live? When, what year am I going to die? And somebody asked me that when I was last in Tibet. I was up, I was up by uh, Asami Chimpu, which is where Guru was with his 25 disciples in this series of caves up above Samye. And there was a Lama or a Yogi in retreat there. And I was visiting him and he asked me that. He, he said, how long am I going to live? And that was a really interesting process for me to try to feel into that. Like, how long do I really think he is going to live? And should I tell him what I really think? <laughs> or what, what, uh, what he might want to hear? So, yeah, that's an interesting idea that they have, that you have already pre-existing a life expectancy uh, because of your karma, as well as other things. But we do have that with dogs. You know, we have, uh, well, what is life expectancy of this breed? That they do kind of have a, an internal genetic clock that's ticking away. Do you think that, I, I've never really read anything about this, but do you think that our grandparents and parents' death time, uh, age, is there some indication that this is genetic? I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I know. I just, um, what I, what I think I, you know, it's, I don't know. I think what's in, yeah, I just the think what's, what's so interesting is if we plan, it seems to me like we can take care of a lot of emotions and attachments and aversions well in advance so that we can be more free so that we can be more free at a time when we're really going to want to like when you led us through our meditation today we you know i can imagine there might have been some people listening today when you said what are your regrets people are having to think of them you know, and conjure them up and tune into them and wonder about them. How wonderful to be able to do that all in advance so that um, those aren't showing up at the last mm -hmm. minute to distract us, to make us, you know, feel heavy and burdened. And mm -hmm. so I think that's the best is just, just to create the freedom to be able to go through a transition that's already going to be hard enough, hard enough as it is. Yeah, yeah that's. That's true. And the more you have prepared and then you, you can release some of those things. And also people aren't trying to ask you that when you're dying, right. which obviously you're not feeling great. And often your mind is maybe blurred by um, pain killing medications and things like that. So yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Wonderful. Yeah. Do you, do you have, like, in your experience, what are some of the main concerns that people have had um, 
doing this work? Uh, well, I think people come to the work um, because they're afraid. Uh, the main concerns I hear is that I'm afraid I'm alone. I'm alone. Mm -hmm. I don't have a charm. I mean, if we lived in a monastery or we lived in a really death literate culture, our culture, our community, our neighborhood would take care of us. Mm -hmm. But we don't, we don't live. We live in a pretty death illiterate culture. And so mm -hmm. people typically will say they feel alone. They feel far from their teacher. They feel far from their dharmic community. And so that's a pretty big concern. A lot of people are afraid of um, being in pain and having anxiety and having fear. Mm -hmm. um, people are have concerns about wanting to show up for their Dharma friends when their mm -hmm. friends are dying and aren't sure what they could do or what they could offer. Um, a lot of Dharma practitioners have all these teachings, but they haven't really organized them or personalized them. Mm -hmm which is what an opportunity. I mean, there's so many ways to prepare for death. This is just one, you know, where we can really refine and collect and clarify our wishes mm -hmm. in one place so that we can support ourselves. And it's an act, I mean, Tibetan Buddhists, right? And all Buddhists, you know, so many of us, we want to create a virtuous path, right? And we want to, um, we, would, we, we aspire to have acts of kindness and so doing the spiritual care directive is one way, one way to add that to your practice. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, yeah. So this is exciting. I think the other thing that I would mention is POA and Shitro. So in case anyone who's listening doesn't know about those practices, POA is transference at the time of death. And this is something you can practice before you die. We um, we have uh, courses that happen at Taramandala, and essentially it teaches you that process that I brought up in my meditation of the mind body that is connected in the heart, that that process of causing it to ex exit through the top of the head and then directing it in a certain direction. That's essentially what POA is. And usually it's to Amitabha, but could also be to another deity. And then there's Dharmakaya POA where you exit into the nature of mind, which is the best thing to do if you have experience of and a confidence in your experience of nature of mind. So I believe this fall we're planning to have a POA course. It's not announced yet, but uh, we're, we're hoping to have that also online. And then uh, Shitro we have already. Shitro is the practice that you do for the deceased. And it's something that has been very useful to me, particularly when someone in our Sangha dies, we do Shitro. And then for my parents, I did it for 49 days. And so it's something that you can actually do that actually helps yeah. others. And that's now a self-guided course at Tara Mandala. Perhaps we could post the links um, to, to uh, the Shitro. There, you need a transmission to do that course, which I will be giving this summer. I believe it's July 30th. I'm going to be giving that online. So. Um, that's a possibility. Um, and then I see a question coming up here, how to send people prayers that are not Buddhists. Well, I will answer that in that prayers are prayers. Um, prayers are positive aspirations and essentially they can have conceptual content, like I'm praying to Jesus to save you. Or I'm praying to Tara to save you, whatever. Uh, there can be conceptual content, but essentially it's positive energy. And so when we send positive energy to somebody, it's not denominational within Buddhism and it's not religious. It's, it's pure energy. So I wouldn't worry about that like, well, should I do this 
for a non-Buddhist because maybe it would they wouldn't like it if it's not what they would want. If it's just pure positive loving energy, you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Rhonda, so much for this. And um, I think I'm gonna answer a couple of questions because I get questions every week. Uh, so I'm just going to answer a few of the, the uh, non-connected questions that I've gotten. And uh, before you leave us, I'd like to just really express my gratitude, not only for you teaching this through to our mandala, but for you to um, to be doing this for the world, that, that you have had this calling and you've organized it so well. And it must be exciting now to be teaching it, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. it is. Thank you very much, Lama yeah. Sol, for this beautiful conversation. Yeah. And here's a question that came to me that is perhaps um, connected. Uh, lately, I gained a sense of closeness to my dad who passed away a long time ago. I would like to do a special practice in in his intention i guess it's with you know thinking about him uh, this is from monica from boston would shitro be adequate and yes shitro can be done anytime for someone who's passed away even years before and often we get questions about uh, somebody who has taken their own life can 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 Shitra still help them if this happened some time ago? And the answer that I have gotten is yes, because they're still in samsara. Even if they have been reborn, they're still in samsara. And so you doing that will have a karmic impact on their mind stream. That said, the sooner you can do Shitra after somebody passes, the better. First you do Poa, and then you do Shitra. Shitra means peaceful and wrathful, and it's connected to the traditional practices of guiding somebody and helping them in the bardo, which is extremely important because generally when somebody dies, we just leave and we don't really feel that we can do anything for them. So I would like to encourage everyone to do that. Shitra, take, take that online course, um, which is also recently we just released that course and i think it's really good and really helpful that's the feedback we've gotten um and then here's a question i'm very worried that the war in europe will come to many more countries how do we deal with that practice or how do i deal with that through my practice yeah i think we're all worried about that and i think tara practice is really helpful for that. It is a practice that deals with fear. It says that right in the beginning of the green tar, green tar practice, practice for fear. And so we can't have a huge impact on whether that happens or not. We can do our practice and, and the practice of the 13th Tara for the um, stopping of war is very effective. And also, we can direct our intentions in that way, but we also have to deal with our minds and our fear. And that, so the, the green tar practice is good for that. And also, if you are in the war, there may be people listening who are really directly affected by that. that people can listen from Russia and in some parts of Ukraine and, of course, Poland and other countries that are in close and really impacted. I I think Green Tara is really effective. Um, there is an online course for that and I'll be giving transmission for that also in July. So yeah, those are the things that I think will be helpful. Um, when we raise bodhicitta, we mentioned unseen beings. Could you elaborate more about that? Uh, well, I don't have time to list all of them because in the Tibetan tradition, there's a lot. 
of unseen beings. But what I would say is things like spirits connected to trees or sacred places, those are unseen beings. There's Nagas that are connected to the water, to water sources, to rivers and lakes and so on. Those are beings that generally we don't see. Some beings can, can see them. Uh, there's also ghosts. There's, there's people who are stuck in the bardo or stuck in, at, in a certain place that we don't necessarily see, but there's a presence there. So those are a few of the unseen beings that may be impacting us. And just what I would say about that is there's no need to be afraid of them in the same way that there's all kinds of beings that we can see around us. Uh, that there's no need to be afraid of. They're just there and we try to have a positive impact on them as positive as possible. So I'll answer one more question. Due to illness affecting my focus and memory, this is one individual, but I would uh, imagine there's others. I'm looking for a simple daily practice I could do. My physical body doesn't allow me to sit for long periods. So this is from Joe in New York. What I would suggest is doing the practice of shamatha, presence with the breath. The breath is something that's always there. It's a very portable meditation object and it's always changing. You know, every breath is different. So let's just try like inhale now, feel that breath. And then exhale and feel that breath. And then when you inhale again, it's different. It's a different breath. So that means that each breath is a teaching on impermanence. It's also a practice of presencing, being with the present moment, which is always changing. So even though this is such a common meditation, you might think, oh, the breath, that's boring, I've done that. <laughs> you always hear about the breath. It's actually not boring. It's such a fresh, ever-changing, dynamic, beautiful presence. There's also the thought of, of, of what you're taking in and what you're letting go of or taking in the suffering of others and offering back loving kindness. So all of those things are in the breath. And so Joe, I wish you great blessings in your recovery and thank you for your question. It's a very important question because if you're that ill, you probably are not doing a lot. And so you have time to meditate. And I know it can be hard also if you're in pain or just struggling a lot physically to have the energy to do something with your mind. So really encourage you to spend some time doing that and also to attend this course <laughs> that Ron is doing. Um, what's the start date of that course? Let's see. Do, uh, do you know? Or, yeah, it's, um, we're starting July 12th. It'll meet for nine Tuesday nights. And then we have discussions, an hour of discussion every Friday of those nine weeks. Okay, yeah. great, wonderful. So there's a class and then a discussion. That's that's rich. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. So thank you again, Rhonda, and thanks to Dreame and Bodila for supporting us today. And let's take a moment to dedicate the merit from our time together. The merit is the positive energy that we accumulated together. Let's offer that out to benefit all beings, particularly beings who are having problems or in a situation of fear and suffering right now. Just give all that merit away. Thank you very much.
Thanks to everyone. And lots of love to you, Rhonda, and everyone out there in the ethers. And we'll see you next week. Lots of love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lamala. Thank you, Rhonda. It's been so inspiring to hear you uh, both talk and share so much. Um, it's very important to bring this uh, topic up and raising our awareness to the art of saying goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And dear community, much gratitude for sharing your valuable time and energy with us and each other. We hope you enjoy what we are doing here. And um, don't forget about, about our uh, live stream event on Tuesday, uh, June uh, 14th at 9 a.m. Pacific time, time, 10 a.m. Mountain Time, and it's 6 p.m. Central European Time. The event will be with Lama Sultrim Alyone and Tulku Osel Dorje to celebrate the occasion of Sagadala Duchen. And we also invite you all to do practice, recite mantras, make offerings, and generate positive karma on this most auspicious day. And at this point, I want to remind you that uh, you can make a dana offering to Lama Sultrim and Rhonda Lapresti, the Buddha taught that the practice of dana, whereby those who share the teachings are dependent on those who receive them. Ultimately, in a time where we have so much available to us at the touch of a button, this act of offering helps us take a moment to fully recognize the incredibly precious gift of the teacher and the teachings. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And hopefully see you all on Tuesday uh, on either of our Facebook profiles or the YouTube channel also. Um, you can make a butter lamps offerings. You can uh, all uh, find it find it on our website and at the link that was just posted by Body. And oh, uh, Lama uh, would like to uh, get back on, so hello <laughs> back, Lama. La. <laughs> yeah, Adrime. I wanted to say something else about this upcoming Tuesday event which I forgot to say, which is that three years ago, we sponsored a statue of Machi Glapta and many people contributed to it because we were told by our Tibetan teacher that this would dispel obstacles. And it took this long to get this quite large statue completed and it's quite incredible. I've seen pictures of it. And so on Tuesday, we're going to have the unveiling of that statue in the temple at Taramandala. So uh, my son will be in the temple and we'll be doing a practice of the Buddha because this is the Buddha's birthday, enlightenment day and passing day, Parinirvana. Uh, and then we will have the unveiling of this statue with the invocation of Mashi Lapdran. And this is a historic occasion for Taramandala to have the statue completed. And so I just wanted to be sure that everybody knew about that. I hope people are still on and listening and uh, perhaps I'll do a little video and put it up on, on Facebook and Instagram about this. Um, actually, I think there is one up now. Uh, talking about that, but maybe I'll talk a little bit more about this statue and do another one. But that's it. So that's Tuesday, and that'll be 9 a.m. Pacific time uh, when we'll start that. And it will be a simultaneous event, which we've never done before, between here in California and in the temple at Taramandala. So looking forward to being with you on this. Really, it's the most important holiday of the Buddhist calendar. So, see you then. <laughs> Tare tu tare tu re 
तू तार तू 